The final item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 10433 in the name of Rachel Hamilton on Scotch Whiskey Contribution to Scottish Tourism Industry. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Rachel Hamilton to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is a pleasure to rise to my feet today to praise and highlight the great work of the Scottish whisky industry and the boost for tourism it provides. All over the world, Scotland is known for its national drink, from New York to Tokyo to Sydney. Scottish whisky is bought and sold in restaurants, bars and shops. According to the Scotch Whisky Association, 39 bottles are exported every second and it accounts for 80% and 20% of all Scottish and British food and drink exports, respectively. Deputy Presiding Officer, on a recent trip to Brussels, I reminded Michel Barnier that the French consume more Scotch whisky than they do cognac, to which he replied that he was partial to the stuff himself. We are quite rightfully proud to, a, proud to be able to sit down in almost any establishment in the world and peruse a list of countless whiskies, many of which are only produced a matter of miles from our own front doors. I'm proud to tell fellow members here today that this will soon be the case for me as well in my constituency of Ettrick Rocks from Berwickshire. For the first time since 1837, more commonly known as the year Queen Victoria acceded to the throne, Whiskey will be produced in the Scottish borders by the Three Stills Company, who are currently putting the finishing touches to their distillery in Hoyk. The borders has a proud history of food and drink, and I look forward to the future growth of this sex sector, which will shortly include a whiskey distillery. It is a pleasure to welcome their representatives and many other whiskey companies to the Scottish Parliament today. Deputy Presiding Officer, nothing excites my staff more than having a day dedicated to whisky. Of course, like many other distilleries across Scotland, the three stills will look to capitalise on the growing tourism boost seen in the whisky industry and the tourism sector as a whole. World famous brands bring with them global reaching interest and it's great to see tourists from across the world being drawn to visit a world leading industry at work and of course to try a few drams along the way. I'd like to pay tribute to all who have played their part in this achievement from tour guides to tour operators as part of a wider Scottish success story. Members will be aware that in 2016, 1.7 million people visited a whisky distillery in Scotland. This is up a quarter since 2010. And no doubt this has grown even more. This will grow even more in 2017 with the boom in the number of international visitors to Scotland. The draw of Outlander has undoubtedly played a part in attracting tourists, as well as the creative and tailor-made North Coast 500 Whisky Heritage Discovery Tour showcasing the best of what the Highlands region has to offer. By the very nature of our whisky making, many of the jobs that the industry provides are located in rural areas. Around 70% of those directly employed by whisky companies live in these areas. And this means better career opportunities for young people, allowing them to stay where they grew up and contribute to their local communities. As whisky tourism grows, the need for more jobs will too. And I hope this goes some way in ensuring the balance of the Scottish economy is not further weighted towards our main cities and urban areas. Tourism skills should become a priority for us all as Brand Scotland and Brand Great Britain become ever more popular around the world. Only yesterday, I held a tourism event for 150 S4 pupils from across the borders alongside developing young workforce and Borders College and lots of local businesses to highlight the massive opportunities that tourism presents from brewing to distilling to becoming a tour guide. Whiskey, whether it is exporting products or importing tourists, will be of great value as the United Kingdom embarks on a new chapter in its global ambitions. It was great to see the Prime Minister alongside the CEO of Scottish Whiskey Association, Karen Betts, secure a 10-year renewal of the Scotch whisky trademark in China just a few weeks ago. Currently, 25 bottles are exported to China every minute, and it is right that we see our great brand being protected, paving the way for even more sales in the future as the Chinese taste for luxury British, Scottish, and European products increases. 
Another compelling reason for the Edinburgh China Airlink project, which is, I'm sure we can all agree, well overdue. This will make it even easier for Chinese tourists to come and see our fantastic distillery tours. Recent figures show the USA continuing to be our biggest export market in terms of value, and this looks set to continue as their appreciation of single malts grow. We're all very aware of the importance of American tourists to Scotland, whether it be for whisky or otherwise, and I hope this continues for many years to come. Of course, it is worth noting that not all of these visitors to our distilleries are from overseas. Yes, many of our main export markets like China and the USA are significant sources of whisky tourism, but Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom are too. Let me also remind members that not all whisky tourism visits are to distilleries. In my previous role as an MSP for South of Scotland, I had the pleasure of enjoying the whisky experience at the Glenkinchy Distillery in East Lothian, as well as the historic timeline tour. Customers are educated on how to enjoy and taste whisky, which I certainly enjoyed. Glenkitchy also take their commitment to the environment very seriously and have created wildlife walks amongst the cooling ponds in the ground. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's a pleasure to bring the attention of the Parliament to our thriving whisky tourism industry. We are all very aware here, and I'm sure in the HM Treasury in London, the importance of the Scotch whisky brand. And the, and the importance that tourism brings is valued as a consequence. This will be even more important in the coming years as we strike new trade deals, perhaps better suited to the UK industries across the globe, as well as with the EU, ensuring a global Scotland, a global Britain, and a global Scotch whisky industry. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. The speeches of up to four minutes, please. Richard Lockhead, followed by Alison Harris. Uh, thank you, and I congratulate Rachel Hamilton in bringing forward this debate so we can celebrate the Scotch whisky industry and everything it contributes towards Scotland. And I expect we'll all be in the mood for a dram after we've listened to all the various speeches. I know I am uh, already. Scotch whisky, of course, is a global and a Scottish phenomenon and is the most successful food or drink export from Scotland and indeed the whole of the UK as well. And of course sustains tens of thousands of jobs throughout Scotland eh, and particularly in more rural areas of the country as well. So it's very important to recognise that the economic contribution is not just the manufacturing, it's also the fact that it invites many people to visit our country, to visit the distilleries, the visitor centres and see where the, the whisky is actually produced. It's a phenomenal success story and we really should make as much as possible of the fact that whisky has contributed so much to the Scottish brand around the world. If you go around the world and people associate Scotland with quality and products you can trust and uniqueness and of course the fantastic landscapes and it's Scotch whisky that's opened the door for other products throughout the whole of the world and that's why it is of so much importance to the country. The fact that, as the Scotch Whisky Association briefing says, that there's 30 new distilleries in the pipeline or have been planned at the moment or even built, uh, that's a sign of, of fantastic confidence in the sector at the moment as well. And I know in my own constituency of Speyside, where 50% of Scotch is produced, and I am lucky enough to represent something like 45 to 50 distilleries, uh, that we have seen a number of distilleries either being built in the last few years, new ones, on top of the enormous number we already have, or of course expanding some of the bigger distilleries uh, in Speyside have expanded even more in the last few years or are being expanded at the moment. Glenlivet, Macallan of course, uh, and so many of our distilleries. And if you look at what's happening with Macallan, with the over £100 million investment in building a new distillery at Craig Ellerke, the new Macallan uh, Distillery, that's going to be a visitor attraction in its own right. And of course, the architects there are world famous and they reckon that's going to double the number of visitors that are going to visit the new Macallan Distillery compared to the old one uh, as well. So it's uh, an industry in space and throughout the whole of the country that's going from strength to strength. We also have other areas. It's not just, as Rachel Hamilton says, people visiting the distilleries. In Speyside, we have the, the Keith and Dufton Railway, with at one end of the railway line, we have the picturesque Strathyla Distillery, which many people visit. At the other end of that railway line, the Heritage Railway, we have the Glenfiddich Distillery, which of course is also a major tourist attraction in its own right, and a very successful uh, Scotch whisky as well. And there's talks at the moment about how we can expand the role of that railway line and attract even more visitors to Scotland to travel the whisky line uh, in Speyside. I do want to make the point that uh, the 
Whiskey is not just about the magic of the malted barley, the spring water and the yeast, and the casks and the colour and the nose. It's also about the folklore and its place in Scottish history as well. And that's why I very much welcome the efforts just now to recognise the role of smuggling in Speyside in the 16th and 17th and 18th century, which of course formed the bedrock of the Scotch whisky industry we have today. And of course, George Smith himself, the founder of Glenlivet Distillery, was a smuggler before he opened the first licensed distillery in Speyside in 1824. And that folklore is very, very important and can play a huge role in attracting even more tourists to Speyside and indeed other parts of Scotland. And the Cabrach Trust just now are talking about building a new historic distillery in the Cabrach, where there were many illicit distills in the, over the centuries, uh, and also a, a heritage centre at the same time to tell more of the story of the role of the Cabrach uh, in illicit distilling as well. They reckon that between Glenrinnes, Glenlivet, and the Cabrach, there was 400 illicit stills in the 16th and 17th centuries. And of course, as I said before, that is the bedrock of the Scotch whisky industry we have today. So I hope that the the distilleries, the whisky companies, the local communities can get together and celebrate more of the place and history, the social history, the economic history uh, as well to invite more people. So uh, in closing, I think that there's much more that can be done to attract whisky tourists to Scotland. I hope the, uh, the companies can work closer together with their uh, local authorities, with Visit Scotland and the Scottish Government, and I hope the Minister will give some thought about how perhaps that can be achieved in the next few years, provided, of course, we get through Brexit and maintain the protection that's there for Scotch whisky uh, at the moment, which is a very important political priority for the Scottish Government as well. <clears throat> Alison Harris, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Well, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We are fortunate to live in a beautiful country which, despite our somewhat unpredictable weather, draws people from all over the world to enjoy the scenery, history and culture that Scotland offers. Since the time that the writings of Sir Walter Scott and the artists of the early Victorian era first attracted English tourists to Scotland, an added attraction has been that Scotland is the home of the world's finest whiskies. Through the decades, Scotch whisky and its links to the economic benefits that tourism brings has grown and grown. More than half of Scotland's distilleries now welcome visitors, with these numbers achieving, as we've already heard, up to 1.7 million visitors in 2016. You could say that this means Scotch whisky distilleries rank among many well-known UK attractions, including the Scottish National Gallery and St Paul's Cathedral. In financial terms, vid visitors spend at distilleries was almost £53 million. The popularity of Scotch whisky continues to take the name and reputation of Scotland to the four corners of the globe. Whilst people from the rest of the UK are vital to Scottish tourism, the largest proportion of visitors come from Germany, France and the United States, with the United States and France being two of the largest markets by value for Scotch. Scotch exports to many other mature and emerging markets has increased and there has been a marked return to growth in China and exports to Japan. Such is the popularity of whisky, around 20% of tourists now include a distillery visit whilst in Scotland. They, there are around some 30 new distilleries either planned or recently built in Scotland and for many new build distilleries a state-of-the-art visitor centre is front and centre of their plans. Visitors are spending more than ever before at distilleries and the average spend is recorded as £31 per person. Whilst distilleries are undoubtedly concentrated in certain regions of the country like Highland, Speyside, Isla and Campbelltown and do much to boost the economies of these areas, let me highlight that there are also lowland distilleries such as Glengoyne and Glenkinchy and later this year a new distillery will also open in my own region. It has been many years since the residents of Falkirk lost the distillery that produces Rosebank, known as the King of Lowland Malts. So I know many constituents are looking forward to the Falkirk distillery opening again near Polmont. It will recognise the importance of attracting visitors by offering, as well as the whisky experience, retail and restaurant facilities. In close proximity to attractions such as Outlander, Blackness Castle, Callender House, the Kelpies and the Falkirk Wheel, the distillery and visitor centre will be seeking to attract up to 75,000 visitors per year. Lowland malts are known for their malty, zesty flavours with slightly fruity, citrusy and sometimes floral notes, 
And I'm sure that with a description like that, the new Falkirk distillery is certain to add to the tourist attractions that already exist in the Falkirk Council area. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is difficult to overestimate the contribution that whisky plays to the Scottish tourism industry. And it's difficult to overestimate the potential that still exists for growth in this sector. But as many distilleries open their doors and improve and expand their offering, I am confident that this is one industry that can look forward to a bright and glowing future. Slan Javar, as they say. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Colin Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and let me add uh, my uh, thanks to Rachel Hamilton for creating the opportunity to talk about uh, the wonderful Scottish product uh, that is whisky. I, I would say to her that between 1837 and now in her parliamentary constituency, it is almost impossible to imagine there was not an informal production of whisky as there was right across Scotland. Uh, indeed, my father as a GP in Fife used to get the occasional informal bottle from one of his uh, patients in the 1950s and 60s. I have uh, with me at the moment uh, an intern, Chase, who's from the United States, and he tells me there are three questions he received prior to departing on his visit to Scotland. Uh, would he be buying a kilt? Would he be trying haggis? And how many whisky tours would he be tagging along for? Uh, thus far, he's no budget for a kilt. He's yet to try haggis, but he's only been on one tour. Uh, so we have a lot still to do. And that's just a testament to how much is uh, known about whisky, how important it is as a symbol, as an emblem uh, of Scotland and Scottish tourism. Why does it account for such a large proportion of all our food and drinks? exports. It's our diversity, I suggest, with whiskey for every possible occasion and palate, uh, with or without food. Um, I have a, a pal who uh, shared a very tiny portion of whiskey out of a bottle that cost a thousand pounds. I'm not going to be buying that myself, and I noticed the care with which he resealed the bottle to make sure uh, there was no escape. There is a little bit of magic in every bottle of whiskey. There is uh, a bit of a gender issue around whiskey. It's predominantly thought of as being a male drink, I have to say. Um, so therefore, I welcome uh, that yesterday, uh, Johnny Walkers have produced a new bottle of whiskey called the Jane Walker, uh, which has, instead of the man in the top hat and the et cetera, et cetera, it is a young lady on the label of the Jane Walker whiskey. Now, uh, I would say that this has not necessarily gone down terribly well. Um, the Washington Post yesterday, Maria Jukas, has written quite a long and amusing article, and at the end she says, uh, this is meant to be satire. So if uh, this is going to succeed, I think uh, possibly we need to be a little more uh, cautious in the way uh, we proceed with it. We know that uh, there are huge numbers of people visit distilleries. My constituency uh, has four, and I hope to get Chase up to uh, visit some of them to multiply his one visit to a distillery. Um, one of the distilleries that uh, I know about is the Isle of Arran distillery. Uh, had over 100,000 visitors in 2017. The numbers keep going up. And I think most uh, distillers have found it uh, useful to have uh, visitor centres for increasing knowledge of whisky, letting people see the skills and the location, let them see the setting that there is uh, for this wonderful drink uh, that goes uh, uh, across the world. Now, of course, I often make personal references in my speech, so I can't let uh, pass uh, my father's cousin, uh, James Stevenson, later Lord Stevenson, uh, who was the managing director of Johnny Walker, uh, when the current symbol that is on the bottles of Johnny Walker uh, was introduced. And indeed, he was responsible for the 1915 Immature Spirits Act uh, in, as part of Lloyd George's government, which meant that whiskey is kept in bond for three years, which improved the quality and improved the marketability of whiskey. Uh, he was also responsible for the fact that the English got a football stadium, Wembley. He was responsible for it. Presiding officer. I'm sort of stunned. <laughs> Call Colin Smith to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. As you always say after Stuart Stevenson, it's a difficult act to follow. Can I uh, uh, 
th can I thank other members? Uh, can I like other members thank uh, Rachel Hamilton for, for tabling today's motion, which has provided us with the opportunity to celebrate the significant contribution whisky makes to Scottish tourism. I'm particularly delighted that the motion comes from a, a fellow South Scotland MSP. Presiding officer, it's all part of a long-term plan for the South of Scotland to take over from the Highlands and Islands as Scotland's whisky capital. But uh, joking aside, the Lowlands, where we have Scotland's most accessible distilleries, has always played an important role in Scotland's whisky heritage. After a decline in Lowland distilleries in the 18th and 19th century, that contribution is growing once again, and not just in the production of traditional Lowland light and peated whiskies. Rachel Hamilton highlighted the, the really exciting plans in Hoyek, where the Three Stills Company are constructing the Scottish Border's first whisky distillery since 1837, or should I say, the first legal distillery since 1837, after listening to Stuart Stevenson. But I'd like to take members on a, a Lowland whisky trail slightly further west and into my home region, of Dumfries and Galloway, a region where tourism is crucial to the local economy, attracting £300 million a year in visitor spend and supporting over 7,000 local jobs. It's an inspiring region whose unique towns and villages, unspoilt beauty, tr truly contrasting landscapes and mesmerising history offers visitors so much. We have an abundance of, of rare wildlife and our, our stunning forests, uh, our fantastic sandy beaches along our coastline, and we have some of the clearest skies in Europe to gaze up to from the Dark Skies Park in Galloway. We can also boast the highest village in, in Britain in one look head, the food town Castle Douglas, the artist town Kirkcubri, Scotland's national book town Wigton, the marriage capital Gretna Green, and of course, the football capital of the world, Palmerston Park, where Queen of the South play. Well, okay, maybe not the final one, but whether you're into ice cream, mountain biking through a forest, or flying across one of Europe's longest zip wires, Dumfries and Galloway has a wonderful growing tapestry of visitor attractions. And I'm delighted to say now includes Scotland's first whiskey distillery when you cross the border, Annandale Distillery. Presiding officer, the rebirth of Annandale Distillery is a wonderful story that deserves to be shared. Originally established in 1836, its doors were closed by then owners Johnny Walker in 1918, seemingly forever. That's until Professor David Thompson and his wife Teresa Church happened across the derelict distillery when walking in the Annandale countryside. Fascinated by the history and potential of the distillery, David and Teresa rescued the ruins in 2007. After a significant investment of nearly £11 million, the distillery sprang back into life on the 3rd of November 2014, complete with visitor shop and cafe. I had the pleasure of meeting David and Teresa for the first time around five years ago when I was chair of Dumfries and Galloway Council's Economy Committee. And the council was supporting the rebirth of the distillery, recognising the huge contribution it could make to the local economy. Since then, I've followed the fascinating story of Annandale closely, such as the, the careful development of the distinctive Annandale logo, which is a, a ship sail paying tribute to Annan's rich maritime history and shipbuilding heritage. On the 15th of November last year, I had the pleasure of attending the breaching of the, the first barrel at the restored Annandale, and I can tell members the 99-year wait since Johnny Walker closed the doors was very much worth it. There are two whiskies being distilled at Annandale, whose names derive from two famous Roberts. There's Man of Words, the, the smoky peated whisky named after the seventh Earl of Annandale, Robert the Bruce. And there's also the mellow, fruity and peated Man of Words, cel which celebrates Scotland's national bard and local hero, Robert Burns, who famously penned the deals of war with the excise mine whilst lodging in Annan. Indeed, given that Annandale was probably an illegal distillery at the time Burns was, a, Burns was a local exciseman, Professor Thompson speculates when he's conducting his owner's tours that Burns may well have visited his distillery. Of course, there's no guarantee he did, but it's a cracking story nonetheless. And, presiding officer, that's what makes Annandale Distillery the perfect example of why distillery visits are so popular. They're all distinctive, each with their own fascinating history and stories. They often display stunning craftsmanship. In the case of Annandale, it has been painstakingly restored with many unique features crafted locally to the highest standards, blending tradition with the demands of a modern distillery. It is little wonder that Annandale Distillery today is attracting visitors from right across the world, including from Annandale in Virginia, making a major contribution to the local economy of a relatively small rural town in a highly competitive tourism market. Annandale joins Dumfries and Galloway's other distillery, Bladnock, whose history dates back to 1817 and after a recent period of closure is once again producing whisky and undergoing significant investment to soon reopen to visitors. Together, Annandale and Bladnock continue the fine tradition of producing delightful traditional whiskies in the lowlands and I would highly recommend both to all members. Thank you.
I have Sandra White, followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I, I thank Rachel Hamilton for uh, securing this debate. It's a very important debate, certainly in regards to the uniqueness of uh, whisky and what it means for Scotland exports as well. But obviously, it's not just whisky. People come for the experience. That's part of it. And I think when I go home tonight, I'll get a wee hot toddy, and that might help my call to be part of that as well. I, I wanted to be in this debate because people have mentioned about uh, whisky in various areas. Well, I'm, I'm going to give a history lesson once I've mentioned the fact about my own experience uh, Clydeside Distillery, which we now have in Glasgow. Uh, basically, it's a 10.5 million project in the iconic pump house in Glasgow between the Riverside Museum and the Hydro Arena. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that Tim Morrison and his family uh, had got together, recognised it and built that there. It opened just before Christmas uh, 2017. I've had the pleasure of being down there, a visitor centre, uh, 25 employees at the moment, more employees advertise. There's a great video display telling you all about the experiences. And the reason I, I want to talk about the history is that Tim Morrison's uh, great-grandfather uh, built the pump house in 1877. So it's sort of like coming home for Mr. Morris and, the, and his family who built it in this iconic site. But it's not just about that. People talk about whiskey, but Glasgow has, has got a fantastic history of having distillers in Glasgow on the Clyde side, and obviously with the boats coming in, being the exports came in, they would export the whisky out. But I just want to give you a, a wee bit of history of why you must thank Glasgow for the fact that whisky is actually here in Scotland as well. Uh, and uh, I don't want to be political about it, but it does start way back in 1707, uh, when the Glaswegians and, and obviously the, the England and uh, Scotland, uh, they were not very happy, uh, the Glaswegians in 1707, and basically to stop any riots in the streets, they weren't allowed to gather more than three people in the streets. And uh, they were very incensed about various uh, bits and pieces, uh, and there was rioting, and the rioting actually started was when the British government decided to start the collection of the first malt tax in 1725, and that's when they started to riot. Now, try and cut it as short as I possibly can, and uh, the Rose obviously opposed the tax, and they attacked the property of Daniel Campbell of Shawfield, and they attacked that, they rioted, uh, they plummeted in his house, Glassford Street and Trongate between there, and obviously caused a lot of damage, etc. cost too. And basically, in the end, uh, the, some were jailed, some weren't, but Glasgow had to pay Daniel Campbell of Shawfield the sum of six thousand zero eighty pounds in compensation for the damage that was done. So he sold his house off and he moved to the islands of Isla and Jura. And because it was uh, his uh, private connection, uh, basically there, he looked at the malt whisky uh, production that was coming to the fore and decided to introduce new crops such as barley. And because he owned these islands, then nobody visited them to actually ask them for tax. So basically, he started up the whisky area in the Isla in Jura. And this became known as uh, Bowmore, was the first planning village to be created. And this was created in 1760. And from there came the Bowmore Distillery, as, as we know it just now. So that was a continuation of that. And I just want to say that it does seem right that uh, Scotland's national drink, with an industry that employs 10,000 people directly and another 30,000 indirectly, can actually trace part of its growth back to the bubbling sense of injustice of Glaswegians. So the right stems from the most Glaswegians of desires, both to chart our own path and our own destiny as a city and to enjoy a few wee swallies without being sold up the river. Thank you very much, President Officer. <laughs> Call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And many thanks and congratulations to Rachel Hamilton for bringing this fantastic debate to the Chamber. Member, members will know that I seize every opportunity I can to talk about the magnificent Stirling constituency that I represent. It's a hugely attractive area for all year round visitors due to our unsurpassed historical heritage and spectacular natural settings. But the Stirling area is also home to the creation of some wonderful whiskies, with excellent events and attractions for locals and visitors alike to enjoy. Our first stop on the Stirling Whisky Tour is Deanston Distillery, operating as a cotton mill into the 20th century. It housed the largest water wheel in Europe at the time, which was used to power the machinery of the spinning mill and weaving shed. 
and hydro power still to this day produces much of the energy that the distillery needs. However, following the decline of the cotton industry, Deanson Mill closed its doors in 1965. But all was not lost. The mill was converted into a distillery and the first ever bottle of Deanson Highland single malt, very creamy it is indeed, was produced in 1974. And in 2012, I was privileged to attend the official opening of the magnificent new Deanson Distillery Visitor Centre. This opening signalled the beginning of a new era for the old mill, not just as a popular producer of whisky, but as a popular tourist destination in its own right. And Deanson's unique story is carried across the globe. Whisky lovers can share in the experience of, the produc of its production at its highly recommendable facility. Now, Stirling Constituency is also home to the incomparable Glen Goyne Distillery, located at Burnfoot Farm. Glen Goyne Distillery operates in the area where George Connell began secretly distilling out of the site of the exciseman and probably supplying half of Glasgow of Sandra's right at the same time. Um, as an aside, in 1899, the distillery manager Cochran Cartwright, what a wonderful name, drowned in the distillery having sampled much of the distillery's product, or so it is alleged. In 1903, Glengoon of Burnfoot changed its name to Glengoyne Distillery, and the 20th century saw production boom as the local product gained increasing international appeal. The distillery's building it's, and its remarkable setting is a must-see, less than 40 minutes from Glasgow, it's often dubbed as Scotland's most beautiful distillery. Officer, these two distilleries, Deanston and Glengoyne, I can personally testify produce outstanding whisky and also provide superb visitor attractions in the Stirling area. The park, perhaps, perhaps we can't compete with Richard Lockhead and Speyside in terms of the numbers of distilleries, but I'm sure we can compete as far as quality is concerned. And Stirling's area relationship with the Water of Life has inspired the Stirling Whisky Festival which has returned for its seventh year in a row, and now in the Stirling Highland Hotel, right in the centre of the town. This, and right in the centre of the old town, this festival has been hugely popular, helping to support many tourism-related businesses that Stirling has to offer, with increased footfall into the city, which appears to be on the up. Last year's visitor figures show that Stirling Castle had an 18% increase, based on figures from 2016. Similarly, 8% more people visited the Battle of Bannockburn Visitor Centre and the Smith Museum and Gallery too also saw increased visitor footfall. To conclude, President Officer, it's clear the Stirling area has much to offer in terms of tourism and visitor activities. However, showcasing our proud whisky heritage is an, e an excellent opportunity not just to promote our local whisky products, but also support local businesses such as those in the hospitality industry who rely on the footfall for visitors and tourists alike. And again, I congratulate Rachel Hamilton for getting this debate tonight in Parliament. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Rachel Hamilton for securing this debate. As a whisky drinker with over 60 bottles of malt at home, I can confirm to Stuart Stevenson that there is indeed a, a little bit of magic in every bottle. Whisky and whisky tourism is one of the success stories of 21st century Scotland. There are 99 million cases of whisky exported each year, and if every bottle was laid end to end, the bottles would stretch from this parliament to New York six times over. Visitors to distilleries come from some of the largest markets for whisky, mainly Germany, Scotland, the USA, France, and from other parts of the UK. The Scotch whisky industry, through the establishment of the Scotch Whisky uh, Research Institute in my constituency some 40 years ago, aims to sa safeguard consumer confidence in Scotch whisky and as a result will protect whisky tourism. Research is carried out by the Institute to ensure flavour, quality, consumer safety and authenticity is maintained to protect Scotland's whisky as a premium global brand. One of the first key achievements of the Research Institute was the establishment of the compositional database to protect Scotch whisky from counterfeiting. 
At any moment in time, there can be around 70 court cases being fought and hundreds of investigations in order to protect the industry against fakes. Yet, the industry allows whisky to be exported in bulk, where it can be blended with other whiskies, locally branded, then competes with our own whisky, or that same local whisky can be deliberately labelled wrongly and sold as Scotch whisky at a premium price, but as a counterfeit product. Blended whisky accounts for 70% by value and 90% by volume of all whisky exported. Malt whisky accounts for only 9% by volume and 24% by value. Yet it is only the premium product, malt whisky, under the UK Scotch Whisky Regulations 2009 that requires it to be bottled in the country of origin. At the time of the regulations being passed requiring that malt whisky be bottled in Scotland, the Scotch Whisky Association stated, and I quote, exports of Scotch whisky in bulk has led to adulteration and contamination when it is bottled abroad. This risks damaging the reputation of Scotch whisky and leaves consumers vulnerable to counterfeit products, which could also have public health implications. So given the number of ongoing cases and investigations into counterfeit whisky, isn't it time that this subject was re-examined? After all, Spain insists that Rioja wine is bottled before export, and France has similar regulations in place for cognac. My SNP colleague at Westminster, Martin Docker Hughes, submitted an early day motion in December supporting Unite Union campaign Save Our Scotch. In recent years, there have been the closures of Port Dundas and Kilmarnock, plus concerns raised by the union regarding Leaven and Shield Hall. Since 1980, 12,000 directly employed jobs in whisky have been lost in Scotland. Jobs are still under a threat at a time when the SWA estimates that Scotland is home to more than 20 million casks of maturing whisky. That's almost four for every person living here. The concerns is not just about outsourcing of whisky, but other white spirits currently bottled in Scotland and the potential impact that this could have on the supply chain, including bottling plants, labelling and packaging manufacturers, warehousing and distribution. Each year, 1.7 billion is spent on the whisky supply chain, but not all that's spent in Scotland. It's estimated that over 340 million is spent elsewhere to our detriment. We know that Scotch whisky must be produced in Scotland, made from mostly malted barley and aged in oak barrels for three years or more. However, most of the jobs associated with the industry are not in distilling, but in bottling and throughout the supply chain, which we must ensure remains in Scotland. Presiding officer, I'll leave you with this thought. Back in 1979, the Scottish Council of Development and Industry in a discussion paper, should Scotland export bulk whisky, concluded, and I quote, Scotland would economically benefit in the long term if the bulk export of all whisky was banned. Given the industry's importance to Scotland and tourism, then isn't it time that this issue was re-examined? I now call on Fiona Hislop to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, uh, and can I thank Rachel Hamilton for securing the debate and for her speech. Uh, she makes the point about the French consuming more whisky uh, than cognac, and that's just in one month compared to cognac for a whole year. And can I thank all the members who have contributed to what has been a very interesting debate on Scotland's national drink. We heard from Richard Lockhead, who has been and continues to be a, a great champion of whisky. Um, an important point that uh, he made was how whisky uh, opens the doors to other products as well in terms of exports. But he also spoke of the current sheer dynamism of this sector. Colin Smith referred to the mission creep of the south of Scotland, but I was also very pleased to hear about the Annandale distillery uh, as well. And Stuart Stevenson introduced us to Jane Walker. 
Now, there are not many constituencies across Scotland that do not have some link to the Scotch whisky industry in some form or another. Indeed, I recall being served a St Magdalene whisky from Linlisco in my own constituency when I visited the Pixar studios in Los Angeles on a government visit. And this extensive reach of whisky demonstrates the foundations which this fantastic industry has across Scotland and its importance to the economy, people and the communities of our land. And Alison Harris mentioned the opening of the Rosebank uh, distillery, which sits on the, the edge of my constituency, uh, but is in the central region. Many of the distilleries lie in the heart of our rural and island communities right across Scotland, from the Highlands and Islands to our Lowlands. And the role of these businesses and the jobs they provide cannot be understated in supporting communities in remote areas. And today we can celebrate another success story in the Lowlands uh, through the Three Stills Company, who are investing £10 million into their distillery and visitor centre near the subject of the motion that Rachel Hamilton has brought to us today. And together with the planned £40 million Mossburn distillery near Jedburgh, this will open up the borders to new tourism opportunities. And these investments will provide firm foundations for the success in future years of our iconic Scotch whisky. And the whisky sector is continuously building upon its success and its brands are increasingly recognised internationally and its distilleries uh, are, are must-see destinations for our tourists. And the Scottish Whisky Association's latest annual survey found that visits have increased by around a quarter since 2010 and more than half of Scotland's 123 distilleries now welcome members of the public. Examples of that success are places like the Tomatin Distillery Visitor Centre near Inverness, which uh, experienced its most successful year in 2017, with visitors exceeding 49,000 and for the first time record sales of 1 million. And according to Diageo, its 12 malt distilleries have seen a 96% rise in visitor numbers over the past five years. And interestingly, 43% of German visitors, and that's our, our, our second biggest overseas market for tourists, visited a distillery on their visit, and that's compared to the visitor average of 20%. Collectively, Scotch whisky distilleries rank amongst some of the most popular Scottish and UK attractions that visitors step into a distillery. Uh, the passion, the knowledge and the enthusiasm of those who work there is evident from the outset with quality presentation and exhibitions. And the visitor sees the striking contrast of traditional whisky making combined with modern technology, high quality attractions and gift shops. But this timeless and unmistakable smells nod to days gone by, giving tourists an evocative sense of Scotland's rich heritage. And every distillery has its own heritage and its own story. And I think that important point about the folklore, the story and the heritage is very, very important indeed. And I visited Isla and I visited a number of distilleries and every single one of those distilleries had its own story. So the social and economic and cultural heritage uh, mustn't be underestimated. And of course, uh, Richard Lockhead referred, referred to space side smuggling. So there are different aspects to these stories. So when the visitor uh, visits, when they then walk into the cold, dark rack house, visitors are stepping back in time. The muffling si uh, silence and the years of dust on the barrels emphasise the rich and historic tradition we have here in Scotland. It's difficult for anyone not to feel a sense of awe when surrounded by the work of previous generation that is yet to be enjoyed. And then, of course, there's the taste. And that's why it's easy to see why uh, uh, a total of £53 million was spent on whisky by visitors in 2016. And that average spend per person has increased 13% uh, to £31 from £27. And indeed, the high standards that these attractions offer is more than ably illustrated by the Oban Distillery winning the Association of Scottish Visitor Attractions Best Visitor Experience Award in 2017. And that was against very stiff competition. But of course, there are new developments. And Sandra White, in a fascinating speech, uh, told us about the Clydeside Distillery and great opportunities there for Glasgow to tell their story and what a distinct story it is indeed. Indeed? Rich, <coughs> excuse uh, me, sure Richard the, Lockhead. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary wouldn't want to let my good friend Sandra White get away with the claim that Glasgow 1707 was the birthplace of uh, Scotch whisky, as we know it today, given the reference in this fantastic book, Scotland's Secret History, the Illicit Distilling and Smuggling of Whisky, by Charles McLean and Daniel McCann, edited by Mark Ellington, says that as late as the end of the reign of James VI and I, who died in 1625, whisky, as we know it, was made in Highlands only. 
Fiona Hisla. Well, presiding officer, perhaps I may leave it to the, 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 the presiding officer's uh, due, due responsibilities to, to decide. No, I, I, think, uh, I think indeed there are many contested things in the world about whisky, but I cannot uh, contest the role of Speyside and the Highlands in the history of the development of, of Scotch whisky. Uh, there, the, the importance to tourism is evident, uh, but there is more we can do to help promote whisky trails, local marketing, hospitality opportunities, Opportunities. We see that already happening with the North Coast, North Coast 500 and there's more can be done. And of course, whisky festivals as referred to by um, uh, uh, Bruce Crawford. Uh, we see that in Stirling and Speyside and, and Isla and they're all growing in interest. Uh, but of course, there are challenges that uh, we are facing and of course, uh, leaving the EU will be one of them. And of course, many distillers rely on EU nationals, not least to understand the different EU markets and also for the language skills. And I visited Deanston Distillery, referred to by Bruce Crawford, on the banks of the River Teeth, and I heard firsthand about the impact of Brexit on the tourism sector. And all of the senior staff I met there were from uh, EU countries, people that had come to live and work here and were committed to delivering a fantastic visitor experience. So, presiding officer, as I bring um, my, my remarks to a close, we can't rest on our laurels. Uh, we want to drive forward our tourism sector. We want to make sure that we can promote the combination of food and drink and tourism. Uh, the strategy that's been developed with the Ambition 2030 Food and Drink is reaching out on tourism. And similarly, in terms of um, my responsibilities, I can inform um, the, the Chamber that the first national food tourism strategy is being developed to, to take forward those links between the food and drink and tourism sectors. And there are challenges, and I think Gordon MacDonald is right to, to make an important point about integrity and reputation of the product that we're also then promoting internationally, because it's very important that we recognise the interdependence between food tourism, Scotland's <coughs> reputation and the hospitality sector, but integrity of experience and integrity of product is very much at the heart of that. So skills will be an important development. I was very pleased to hear Rachel Hamilton talk about um, the, the event that took place in the borders, because we must all take responsibility to encourage uh, more youngsters particularly and others into into the area and um, with over 30 new distilleries being planned over the next five years from the borders to the highlands across our islands tourism can work um, with whiskey and whiskey with tourism to help promote uh, our fantastic product and again make sure that that unique absolutely unique and authentic authentic experience that drinking whiskey in the home of its birth is the one thing that tourists can do in Scotland, but nowhere else on the earth. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.